So, hi. Hi, Heather. Hi, Heather. To start off with, would you guys like to say your names and uh, where you are right now? Sure, I'd like to start though with um, just for the record, thanking you for doing this and also for being persistent. I mean, it's a great project and for being persistent about inviting us. Um, so uh, we both appreciate what you're doing and the opportunity to uh, talk about this in this way. No, oh, thank you. I definitely appreciate you too and wanted to make sure that you had a space that would work for you. So good. Yeah. We're so, happy to do this. Yeah. So, and I'm Eva Gold, and um, we're normally in Portland, Oregon, uh, US, uh, but we have been at the Oregon coast in Manzanita for the last month, and that's where we are now. And the gentleman to your left. <laughs> That's an assumption. <laughs> well, <laughs> I like that. Anyway, I'm Steve Zahm. Okay. Yeah. And you're obviously in the same place. So yes. <laughs> the, uh, the first question that I have for you, it's just so exciting to see people who are actually sharing a physical space in pandemic times. I don't get to do that often. Yeah. Um, so the first question that I have for you is, who are you to each other? What is your relationship? And if there's anything you'd like to say about that. That's fair. You want to start? I could start. Okay. Uh, well, I said I'll start. Let me think about this. Uh, who are we to each other? Mm -hmm. uh, wow. We are many, many big, big things. We're married. We're mates. Uh, we also happen to be partners in in training, training other people in Gestalt therapy for many, many years. Now is Buddhist psychology informed Gestalt therapy. Uh, she's my best friend. Eva's my best friend. Um, <laughs> I could go on and on and on and deeper and deeper. Uh, um, if I need, if I have a problem of any nature, I can bring it to Eva, actually including professional she's you know i can we can we consult with each other mm -hmm. uh we are parents of kids together so we have that mutual thing going and uh, now grandparents and, yeah of three Ooh. three little ones wow there's probably much more but uh go ahead yeah, I don't know that I, that I have that I have too much more to add. That we um, we have uh, taught together. We have been on uh, our sort of our life adventure together. We've been married for almost forty years. Um, Look, co-authors, right? We write together. We challenge each other with our with our thinking and our ideas. Um, sometimes. I joke that between the two of us, we have one brain. Um, so something I might be missing as we're writing something or doing something, Steve will fill in those missing pieces or, or vice versa. So yeah, it's quite, quite the partnership. Hmm. Okay. Um, another question then as individuals would be, who are you? Who are you as a person and what would you say some of your values or your qualities or your passions might be? Uh, who am I as a person? Just a small little question like that. <laughs> I'm joking with you, Heather. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, well, I'll go right to a value of mine as a person, which is, uh, which is fairly obvious about myself uh, at this point. Um, I tremendously value inter interconnection with, with uh, friends, people, family. Interconnection as, as a value is very, very high for me. Hmm. Very, very important. Um, so I live my life in terms of who I am as a person it, with that being reflected in various aspects of my life. I have different families and they're all interconnected and they're all close and that's very important. When I say families, I mean not biological, but the people I work with. I have uh, two different men, men's groups that I go to that have been going on for decades. Uh, 
very, very, very important for me in, in terms of the connection and the inter interconnection be between us. Um, uh, who are, but, but more, yeah, okay, more than that, I mean, there, there are many senses of selves, of course, that I could talk about, like we all can talk about. I'm, I'm a teacher. Uh, I've been teaching for, I don't know, 45 years. Um, I'm, 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 I, I'm a, a psychologist. I'm a, I'm a therapist, and I'm a gestalt therapist. And that's a, that's a big part of who I am, huge, huge part. Um, actually, actually in, in, in the last more than a year, I'm also a person with um, uh, fourth stage lung cancer. So that's also who I am right now. And uh, that's, a, that's a whole huge piece about, okay, there's that, which, you know, that's the beginning of a chapter and we can fill in the chapter if you want. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a person that came from the 60s in Berkeley that the context absolutely molded me in terms of getting tear gassed, uh, you know, listening to Mario Savio, uh, I was also an athlete my whole life. I also competed for, for Berkeley on, on gymnastics. So I'm an athlete. I'm, I'm also identified as an athlete when one of my selves is. And then, you know, when I, I did that very seriously through college and undergraduate and um, then, then expanded into karate, which I did for about 15 years. So the physical component of me is very much big about who I am. One of the things I did when I, um, started private practice, which was hard to break into, was I approached the juvenile system in Vancouver and I gave them the idea of me doing karate therapy with their juvenile delinquents. And so I did that for a while. That was kind of interesting. Um, I think I'm going on too long about who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the point of the interview is to, okay. is to get into who you guys are on, on yeah. a lot of different levels, really. Right. So... What about you, Eva? Where would you start with yourself? You can jump in, yeah. Um, I think about, when I think about who I am, I think about my background and my family. I sort of naturally go there. Um, coming out of a working class background and being on one side the daughter of an immigrant. Um, my father came from Lithuania when he was 10 years old. 1921. Um, so I'm first generation on that on that side. Um, so I identify kind of with that whole story of um, being working class, of the struggles of that. Um, both of my parents were in unions and active in that way, and I feel like that informed my um, politics, my political view, my worldview, my understanding of things. First person. Protected that your sense of self just suddenly went back a hundred years when you said 21. I was like, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. That feels very powerful and very grounding. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was the first person in my family, extended family, to go to college. Um, so anyway, a lot of that, being Jewish, uh, always feeling to some extent, although I've been in and out of Jewish communities, but always feeling to some extent like I wasn't part of the uh, majority culture, that I wasn't, uh, that I was alienated in certain ways. I mean, just the other night watching the... Uh, the Democratic Convention and having it start with someone giving a prayer that included Jesus, um, you know, that that's always felt like something that excludes me. Um, and uh, so just so, so growing up with that experience of, of feeling outside of the dominant culture uh, has shaped me, I think. Um, but I guess, you know, I thought, I, as I'm approaching 70 now, I was thinking recently about like, what's the theme? What's kind of my life theme or what's the, you know? And 
what I came to was that it has to do with learning and then teaching. That process of that from the time I took my first psychology course, which I was lucky enough to have actually in high school, I've been interested in learning about myself and other people. And as soon as I learn something, sometimes maybe prematurely, I want to jump into teaching. Um, and uh, that has really defined me. And it also goes to, I think, our relationship with each other because we've both been on a similar path of like self-exploration and discovery. I'm not very, um, I'm not a big adventurer. I'm not physically strong. I'm not really very athletic. I don't have like musical talent, although I like to sing and dance, but so I don't really have like hobbies or things like that. I don't go, you know, mountain climbing, although I've done a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. And that my sense of adventure is this interior adventure. Mm -hmm. It's about learning about and discovering about myself. And that's taken the form of about for about 15 years of doing a, um, a process of studying creative writing and um, writing poetry and creative nonfiction. And then it's taken the form about the last 20 years more seriously of studying Buddhist psychology, going on meditation retreats. So for me, the adventure is like going off on a silent nine day retreat where I, I'm not gonna have to talk to anyone and I can <laughs> sit and walk and meditate for 16 hours a day and just see what's, what's there, what comes up and what I learn. And, and then sometimes to my own detriment, uh, this teaching piece will come in. A couple years ago, I was on a retreat and I had some kind of discovery. I don't remember what it was. And um, I quickly found myself moving into, well, how would I write about this? Or how would I teach it? Or how would I talk about it? And then fortunately, because it was a mindfulness retreat, I could notice myself doing that and come back into like the present and being with my experience. But that's how that energy gets going in me is that like, oh, this and now how could that benefit other people or how could I bring that in some way? Um, so that's big. And I think I've been doing that since I was uh, a child. I have a five years younger sister. And so uh, I was in that role of learning and teaching and learning and teaching. It seems like you've learned how to share. Uh, yes, <laughs> for sure. And that that's part of the meaning in it for me. It's not just like, oh, I'm sitting on a cushion by myself and I'm, you know, looking for enlightenment or something for myself. But part of what gives it meaning is just with like with doing therapy is how does this uh, benefit other people? Or how can it? How might it? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm curious about a lot of things with, with you two in particular. I mean, I was hoping that we'd get some time to sit around and talk in Mexico, but obviously 10 things happen at the same time in any given moment at a conference. You so, were so busy. <laughs> well, so were you guys. Well, um, you were really busy. <laughs> well, so, okay, maybe it was me, it wasn't you. Yeah. Um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what, how would I even phrase this? What, what the dynamic, um, I, I don't know if it would define, but sort of what kind of dynamic you guys would say you're living right now, I guess is probably the easiest place or time to frame it. Um, Cause I'm always very curious about couples that have been together for a long time. I don't understand that. I've not had that experience. I've not been around that experience. So I, I wonder if there's anything you would say specifically about your dynamic as a relationship. I mean, I know it has so many levels and so many facets, but I wonder just sort of what pops up. I'm just gonna you say the same words so I can get it in my head. Dynamic in our- The dynamic of your relationship. Of our, at, at this point. Mm -hmm. Specifically about this point, yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe it's you know an ongoing theme, I don't know. I'm just- how you are, but in plural. 
Uh, I tell you what, let me start and then sh I'll have her, I don't, ha I don't have the a clarity really, but I can have a design in my head. Um, so we spent 12 years writing our book. This is, and this is to help answer the question, actually, I'm not going somewhere else. And uh, that was quite something. That was really quite something. And, and, and part of what the quite something was, was our, how we dealt with it one another, our, inter, our interacting sensitivities, where we would sometimes really get into it with each other. And uh, we're both extremely forceful and powerful people. And uh, <laughs> so we really got a line on, with, more so than before. We've had couples therapy, so we, we, we knew our issues. Uh, and uh, we, we were greatly influenced, by the way, in terms of couples therapy with Dan Weil. I don't know if you know Dan, but uh, oh well, it doesn't make any difference. Um, yeah, no, and, and my intention is not to pry. I mean, it's, okay. it's honestly just curiosity. No, that's all good. Uh, so so it, because of the nature of writing this book, and sometimes we would spend, I'm, you know, a, a couple days on a paragraph trying to figure out which is the best and how do you do it? And maybe we shouldn't do it. And our, we, we, our interactive sensitivities would sometimes get inflamed. And we paid more and more attention to that because we had to. We really had to pay attention to how that, how that was. And I think that the end result, even though sometimes it was difficult, uh, was really, really beneficial for us. And so we come out of that 12 years piece a couple years ago, I think feeling really good. And um, now, now's the time to get this marvelous book into the world, because I, I have a very strong feeling about that. And um, I get cancer. And so our relationship and the dynamic that we have now is influenced by me being having a cancer that's also metastasized to my brain and it's not, it's not a good thing. And so our relationship itself, then the dynamics of the relationship start to reflect other aspects of our interactive sensitivities. I know these are abstractions, but I, I don't know that I'm gonna go into the specifics, but- um, No, no, that, that's uh, fine. Do you wanna add something to this or? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, what immediately came to mind for me about the dynamic of our relationship, and I think why it's worked, like how it's lasted, which I kind of hear a bit in your question, is support. I, from the very beginning of our relationship, always just felt Steve's support for me, for what I needed or wanted, what made me happy, that sense of like, like uh, when we met, I had uh, finished um, a master's degree in social work and I was interested in this doctoral program that was just starting up in Portland. This was a couple years, I don't think we were even married yet, we were living together. And um, it took me seven years to get through that program. And um, we had our kid, the kids are, are Steve's kids from a previous marriage. And so we had, you know, little kids that we were dealing with periodically. We had private practices. I was going to school and doing private practice. You know, life was very challenging. Um, and there was never, um, <laughs> a moment of um, him questioning the time and energy that I was putting in to school and doing that work. And he just wanted that for me. He just wanted me to, um, you know, go after that. And I don't know if I would have, if I would have a doctorate, really, if it hadn't been for him and for that support and just for that perspective, even. Um, then when I went into this creative writing process, it wasn't anything that Steve wanted to do or follow me into, but he became like my best critiquer and my best editor. Like I would start reading him stuff and he would, you know, learned over time, like how to critique it and how to edit and how to support and how to give me feedback. 
Um, and then when I went into more into like, cause I, I was the sort of the beginning of the meditation and interest in Buddhist psychology. And he just came along with that. And eventually it became, uh, I mean, you could speak for yourself about yeah. this, but eventually yeah. came really important to him. But initially it was kind of a support to me. Like, yeah. oh, sure, I'll try a meditation retreat. Yeah, yeah. So, so that and um, the support piece and the, from my perspective, and then also the uh, ongoing growth, personal growth. For the first 20 years, you know, going to Gestalt, being in Gestalt training together, uh, going to uh, the pollsters, uh, week-long uh, graduates programs or training for trainers, doing all of that kind of thing together and then doing the meditation and the book writing and all of that together, it's just been such a, um, a process of us growing together. The, um, with regard to meditation, um, so I, I, we both had experiences with uh, mindfulness meditation. In fact, in the 60s, I was doing transcendental meditation, but. And, and so we got called back through our various situations into mindfulness meditation. And Eva was doing it, and I wasn't. And uh, I don't know, beginning of the 2000s. And she talked me into coming to a, 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 a <laughs> she literally talked me into coming to a, um, a silent retreat. And uh, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> And there's a couple things that happen. One is, is that it just so happens by luck that the guy that was doing that retreat, his name is Gil Franzdahl, happens to be uh, a, 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 a dude, a Buddhist psychologist with a, with a PhD in, in, in Zen or some from Stanford, very, very sharp guy. But the point is here is that his whole way of being more so than anybody else I've seen do Buddhist psychology lectures and mindfulness and this and that is phenomenological. Mm. And I'm listening to this guy and I'm going, that's Gestalt therapy. That's Gestalt therapy. And as we went on and on and on for years with him, I would have these talks with Gil about, you're a Gestalt therapist, man. And he, it was really funny because he didn't want to hear that. But he was. And that had a huge uh, that was a big help for me. But anyway, I'm kind of straying here. I, she, I came in on her foot, foot, foot tails. Is that it? Uh, coattails. Coattail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, at first I said, eh, I'm a Gestalt therapist. You do all the Buddhist stuff. You know, I'm a Gestalt therapist. And then oh, when we were starting our training, when we did the training, adding it into the training. And then I started to catch on and really realize the power of this. So that's all I wanted to add. Hmm. Okay. So going back a couple steps, I don't know if this was something also that you did together, or maybe that's where you met. I don't know. How did you get into Gestalt? Hmm. Should I start with that? Go right ahead. Right. <laughs> so that happened for both of us before we knew each other. Um, mm -hmm. And I really love my, mm -hmm. uh, my origin story, my Gestalt therapy or the origin story. So I, I think it's worth taking a little time with. So I was in my uh, second year of the social work program that I was in, master's in social work. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the time. And I was going into my second year, it was the fall, going into my second year. And um, the man I'd been living with had finished his graduate program, moved to California. Wasn't clear what was gonna happen with our relationship. Some of my friends, I'd been an undergraduate there too, so some of my friends had left Ann Arbor. And I just really was not doing great and was not very happy that there. I was ready to be uh, gone. Uh, I was missing my boyfriend. I was feeling just at loose ends. I had one more year of school. I knew I wasn't going to drop out, but I didn't really want to do it. And um, I wasn't, I, the semester had started. I wasn't really doing my work. and. I was saying to everyone, including myself, um, I really don't want to be here. And then I would add, but since I'm here and I'm going to be here, I should whatever, I should make the best of it or I should something. 
So um, a few weeks in, I was uh, walking to the social work building for something and I ran into uh, one of my professors that I'd had the year before and that I was, gonna ha that I was having in, in my second year, Frank Maple, God bless him. Um, and so I started this with him. I started saying, uh, you know, my boyfriend's gone. I'm, you know, I, winter's coming, Michigan winter. I'm not happy about this. I really don't want to be here. But as long as I'm here, I feel like I should be whatever, making the best of it. And he just looked at me and said, oh, it sounds like you don't want to be here. And I said, well, yeah, but as long as I'm here, I should be <laughs> whatever. And he said, it sounds like you don't want to be here. And we finished our conversation. He went back into the building and I went, kept walking and I guess I was gonna to go to the library. And I thought, well, I could feel something shift in me just from that conversation. And um, I thought, well, maybe I'll go to the library and do the reserve reading just for his class. Like mm -hmm. that shifted, like suddenly I felt a little something motivation or something. I go into the library, I pull out the reserve reading, and the first thing that I pick up is Arnold Beiser's Paradoxical Theory of Change article. It gives me chills right now, just even remembering that, because I had had exactly that experience with a person that I, you know, cared about, respected, admired, had some you know transference with whatever who just accepted me and said here's where you are and it shifted my experience like oh here's where i am and i felt the change and then i pick up this article and i read about what that is about how for people who don't know about um Beiser's article paradoxical theory of change article everyone should if you haven't read it um short little article about how we have to start where we are, how we have to be where we are in order to change. It, the change happens organically. It doesn't happen by coercion or trying or shoulds or buts. And that, so that was huge for me. And that's been a foundation. I mean, that has been my grounding really in uh, the world of Gestalt therapy ever since the power for me when I'm working with people of here's where you are. Let's, let's be there. Let's, you know, can I help you support you there? Understand what's happening for you in that place. Um, my, myself, my own work, the, the Buddhist psychology, the meditation mm -hmm. practice, it's all that. Um, and then the icing on the cake, was that uh, there were two icings on the cake actually one was he had a gestalt therapist come into the class and the, that gestalt therapist did a little fishbowl in the middle of the room and within 10 minutes the person that he'd been working with was crying and moving into this like deep material it looked like magic to me and so if i hadn't been you know taken in by it before i certainly was hooked again and then he had us do these little practicum um, experiences. Uh, so I got to actually practice doing that with other people, having other people do that with me. And, um, you know, later I, uh, you know, after moving to Portland, there was all of what happened from there with training and meeting Steve and all of that. But that was really the, the ground for me. And so how did you come in, Steve? Um, I'm putting through my head how much context, how, how much I should tell you um, for the purposes. I'll, I'll give you some context. Um, so after a very bad period of my life when I was in my 20s and actually quit medical school and was floundering around, um, I got into therapy for the second time with a guy by the name of Art Janoff. Do you know about Art Janoff and the primal screen? Uh, well, primal screen I've heard of, heard of not. Well, that's Art Janoff's, that's who he is. Okay. That's the guy that wrote okay. the book. He's the primal screen man. And it just so happens that he happened to be friends with my family. 
and uh, he made himself a zillion dollars, especially after he became uh, John Lennon's therapist. And you can hear some of John Lennon's songs that reflect his experiences with art. Uh, um, so I went into therapy with him again, and uh, art was instrumental at this point in my life in, in really teaching me about feelings, just really getting tuned in and feelings. And he was very much against abstractions and he would um, just, just be, uh, you know, just shut up and go back to that space. And how did you feel and remember that? And I mean, he was, he was, he was, did it his own way, but art was very, very powerful for me. And I, then I determined to become a primal therapist because uh, I had been in a lot of therapy with him, both individual and two years of group. And his, actually his book, Primal Therapy, the, 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 his first book, I'm in it actually in some really vague way because I was in his quote, post-primal group. <laughs> we were cured. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you're better I'm now. joking about this, but it's really <laughs> joke. So I went and I uh, got into PhD school at, at uh, the University of Portland. And it just so happens that my cousin, not my blood, but the guy that was married to my first cousin, uh, was trained by Jim Simpkin. He had gone to Big Sur, spent numbers of months with, with Jim, and decided that he was going to no longer be a physician, he was gonna be a uh, therapist. Jim had a huge impact on, on John, and I would be having these conversations with John where we argued. I would be putting the case forward for primal therapy, and he would be putting the case for Gestalt therapy for a couple of years. And then one year he said, listen, I'm having a workshop in my ranch in Montana, and it's gonna be a small workshop. It's gonna be about six people, and I'm inviting you, and it's for Jim Simpkins gonna lead it. And Jim is the best therapist in the whole world. <laughs> There's just so much narcissism here. <laughs> and so after all of that arguing with him, I said, sure, I'm there. So I did go there. And I had six days with Simkin and was very, very intense because the way Jim did, did that is he did, was only six people. And he did an hour a day for each of us and group at night. There was no hiding and you couldn't hide from Jim. And I won't go into the specifics of what I experienced, but by the time I was done with that, I, he, he had tapes of, of uh, all of us. He gave us our tapes, you know, and I never let anybody see those tapes. They captured me so much it was embarrassing. And wow. even never even saw those tapes. I mean, I finally just destroyed them. <laughs> So it was a pain, it was a difficult experience, but I knew this is it. And the this is it for me was how real it was. It was like, like empirically real. You don't, excuse the word, fuck around with guessing. This is what we see. This is what you do. And as, you know, what, as we all know, this is your process. This is your character. And he captured me and I knew that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the six days, I went up to Jim and I asked him, who else can I train with? Because I didn't think Jim liked me at all. And I didn't say, can I train with you? <laughs> who else can I train with? And, and he said, well, the only other person in the whole universe that I would recommend if anybody train with is Irv Polster. And I've got their manuscript here. Irv and Miriam are writing this book. He's, he had the manuscript in his hand. The book wasn't Ooh. quite ready yet. And so I put that in, in my head. That was Gestalt Therapy Integrated. Great, that's mm -hmm. the great book, Gestalt Therapy Integrated by the pollsters. <clears throat> and I'm living in Portland. And I made it my business to contact them. And I went to a number of their, just when they just moved there from Cleveland. Oh, no, first, oh, I'm skipping a step here. I don't know how many steps I want to give you. But um, I wanted to meet Irv to see who this guy is. And he was doing a workshop with Bob Martin. Do you remember Bob? Oh, it's okay. I, no. It's okay. One of the founders of the LA Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob was amazing. One of my biggest influences on me. Bob was an amazing, amazing man, an amazing therapist. And he lived in Manhattan Beach in California. And I would fly down, well, this is before I flew down there. 
So I went to a workshop that was shared by Bob and with Irv. And there were two groups that they had. And you would go, you know, 12 people a piece and they'd move back and forth between for three days. And I found myself doing all my work with Bob, a lot of work because he was just um, so soft and uh, easy and, uh, uh, you know, easy to work with. And he's like a little, for me, it was just like, it, I felt so supportive and so soft. And when I saw Irv work, you couldn't predict a thing. You didn't know where that guy was gonna go. And he was amazing. He was a magician, but you couldn't predict anything. And I kind of knew that, so I, I wasn't working with him. But then the, the end of the whole workshop, where we were having like about an hour and a half before everybody gets on planes and goes away, I wrote, raised my hand because I was in the, in the group with Irv and I said, listen, I came here really to see you, but I haven't been doing any work with you. I've been doing all my work with Bob. So I just like to sit in the context of this group and talk with you. We'll just chat. And so that's what we did. And I just, I'm chatting with him and, uh, and I'm noticing the people around me getting um, fidgety because they really want to work with Irv and it's about time to end. And I said something like, well, you know, everybody's getting fidgety around here and I'm just chatting with you. And so maybe, maybe I, it'd be a good idea to, to let somebody else work right now. And, and what I'm about to tell you is how Irv captured me in a second. He's just brilliant. He said to me, fuck him. And I go, what? He says, yeah, fuck him. He says, get in touch with your sociopathy. <laughs> and oh, did he have me? He had a part of me that I just was way in my background. I'm so considerate, you know. And anyway, that was my first experience with Irv. And after that, I went for many, many, many weeks to um, first the weeks and then committing myself to the month and then the next month. And then even I would be going there for many, many weeks also for their trainers for trainers and trainers for graduates. Training and for trainers <laughs> and graduates program. Am I answering your question? <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. Absolutely. These are very open questions. You may have yeah, noticed. That's your, that's your um, therapy origin story. Okay. There you go. Yes. Yes. And I mean, the other, the one that kind of follows from that is what has become your thing within Gestalt? And, and not so much, I mean, to get like a sample class out of you about, you know, where you'll say what your greatest, you know, hits from the book would be but sort of what have you come into as your own in this area over the years? Does that make sense? That's a really good question. That's well, a good question. Well, it's interesting when I think about, you know, my, um, the, the place that Steve and I started doing um, training and things together was in like 1979 or 80. And we were part of a training group in Portland that formed, that worked with Isidore Fromm. And that was six years. Isidore would come and do weekends with us and things like that. And he was really, really uh, fun, fundamental, foundational to me really learning, feeling like I learned Gestalt therapy. Um, he taught from, you know, what we refer to as the Bible, Pearls, Hefferlein, and Goodman. Um, and uh, I recently picked up my old book and I see all these underlines and all these notes and how we read that book line by line. And um, it was really my, my grounding. And yet I wonder if Isidore were to see what I'm doing now, if, <laughs> if he would think it had any relationship to, um, you know, what he taught and yet it does. I mean, it's, that's clearly, that clearly is the ground, that clearly is my understanding. The, the contact boundary processes are looking at creative adjustments, um, understanding uh, the relational dynamics, um, observing, making observations, all of that. And yet what I feel like has uh, whatever expanded or shifted for me over the years. And it's one of the things I love about being a Gestalt therapist is that we all do it differently. That, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, ideally, you wouldn't see any two Gestalt therapists do the exact same session. Um, and that I think over the years, the experience of bringing my own experiences 
and getting older is really great as a gestalt therapist because um, now I have like more experiences and I can I can be like the wise wise older woman and I can leverage that in some ways when I'm working and so there's I think that I'm not sure if this is exactly your question but I feel like I've grown into the melding of who I am as a person, who I am as a therapist, who I am as a trainer, that nothing feels like a role anymore. Um, and that Gestalt therapy offers that. And along with the meditation practice, the mindfulness, the Buddhist practice, all of that has uh, elaborated on, expanded, whatever that way of being present, um, uh, not being hierarchical. Um, uh, I think doing the training has also been important in that because it's a different kind of relationship with trainees than with patients. And yet I'm also working with trainees and doing therapy with them in, in the training and sometimes in therapy as well. So it just doesn't feel as um, much like there are uh, compartments. Um, okay. and, and that is important to me. And then also hugely important is the, the teaching, the mentoring, and the kind of offering, offering that to people who are starting out and who are, you know, struggling or, you know, I'm supervising people and someone will say, I feel like some days I don't even, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not sure, you know, what this Gestalt therapy thing even is. And I can both remember feeling that way and also kind of know where to help people come back to, to grounding with themselves with like what's true for them and what their experience is. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of where this question came from, really, is my experience of the two of you of sort of having found your self and your place and your, your thing. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I'm wondering what you'd, you'd say about that, Steve. On my thing, I'm still trying to get to understand the question. You talk about yourself as a teacher. I'm, uh, well, I, that's also true. Um, but I'm thinking of as a therapist now. Uh, well, as a teacher, that's not the therapy piece, but um, I have, I, um, uh, I have a background of coming from a place, especially my dad was a civil rights lawyer. Mm. And uh, I grew up with the osmosis of understanding that one person isn't better than another mm. and there should be equal rights. And this whole piece that he was very involved with, he, was, he worked for the American Civil Liberties Union. And that, that, that hit home from a very early age to me. And so that is infused in all of what I do professionally, just naturally. When I taught, and I taught for, I, I, I made it my business to bring gestalt therapy into academic settings. That was my purpose, really. I taught at Clark College. I taught at Portland State College. I taught at Portland University of Portland. I taught at uh, Portland, Uni uh, Portland State University. And then finally, I ended up with at what's now called Pacific University that offers a doctor's degree. And it was when I started in the ground floor there, it was called the Graduate School of Professional Psychology. And my purpose was to bring Gestalt therapy into academic settings. And the way I did that was from a dialogical stance. It just, it just came naturally to me. I think I'm starting to answer that in some way. Um, I definitely, there's no hierarchy here, even though the students didn't believe that for the first four weeks. And, and I would say, you all get, I would start the, every class with, you all get A's. They wouldn't believe me. Because I firmly got and believed that if you're working and trying to learn for the purposes of getting a grade, it impedes your reading. And so if you, excuse me, it impedes your learning. And so if, if, the, if the purpose is to learn, get rid of the obstacles to learn. And I will take responsibility for turning you on. That's my responsibility. And, 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 and so after 
uh, X number of weeks or months, they would start to believe me that this is really what's happening. And we would have uh, peak experiences in the classes. And I did that for decades, ending mm -hmm. up at Pacific University, uh, which, like I said, um, so that's one of the ways I taught. And that's, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but that was an integration, uh, a confluence of the way I do therapy and the way I do everything. I try it, to do everything. Yeah, it it sounds teaching. kind of like process-based teaching rather than outcome-based teaching. And finding teachers like that, for me personally, was absolutely transformational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the product. It wasn't the outcome. It was the process of learning and being and even the relationship with the teacher. So I, yeah. I do understand what you're saying, I think. Yes, yes. Learning happens when it's organic, self-regulating, and that has to do with wanting to learn. Mm -hmm. The questions come from deep inside of the person. It's a very different thing than, than the, way, the way teaching really happens now. And uh, so I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like, what, what has your thing become? What have you come into in Gestalt? Okay, that's good because I'll, uh, there's a couple pieces. One of, it, one of that is more and more of that dialogical lack of hierarchy. That happened naturally for me, like I was trying to explain. I found that that was going on with me when I started my quote growth groups when I was just a young little pup and had the chutzpah to do growth groups. I can't believe what I was doing, <laughs> but I but I could get I could I spent like a, a, a before I would do a, a group I would sit down. This comes from myself. Just just I made I discovered this for myself. I would think of people individually and get a hard connection with everybody that was coming into my group. So I think of, oh, Mary, and I would just kind of put her in my heart. I wasn't aware of what I was doing, but I was doing meta meditation 40 years ago, 45 years ago, without even knowing what I was doing and coming from it from that kind of meta compassionate place. So that has bloomed and developed now. Now I have a label for what that is. Now I do it more formally. Now I see the power of that kind of holding others in a more formal way, which is very supported by Buddhist psychology, by the way. In mm -hmm. fact, it's more than supported. It, it, it brings it to another qualitative level, which I'm not going to go into in detail. So that kind of blooming for me, in terms of what's natural for me, has been beautiful. It's been just wonderful. That's just one piece. I'll leave it at that. Okay. It reminds me of, this isn't exactly the question, but I'm thinking, I'm starting to think more about legacy also. Mm -hmm. And that one of the things that has been so important to me is that the, way, the things that I've gotten from my teachers, um, Isidore Fromm, Bob Martin, Irvin Miriam Polster, the Polsters particularly, I mean, they just uh, sort of exemplify, uh, you know, uh, how to be a mensch, how to be a, mm -hmm. a person of uh, quality. And, you know, just seeing that they're, you know, who they are, that has always been, when I think about our training, us working together, you know, they're, they've been such a model for that. And that part of what has motivated me is wanting and continuing, like why I'm still working even, right? Um, wanting uh, to offer uh, the people who are coming along, the younger people who are coming along, what I got from my teachers or something close mm -hmm. maybe to what I got from my teachers. Mm -hmm. And seeing that, you know, seeing that happen, hearing that from people from our trainings, that's, you know, that's part of the, the meaning and purpose, I guess, now. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. A couple people have mentioned coming into the legacy phase of their lives. So that sounds like an interesting place to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, I, it all seems like it's been a very fluid process, but I'm wondering if there's a particular challenge that you identify having run up against in all of this and what that would be for you. We actually talked about that. Um, um, the, the hardest thing for me about being a Gestalt therapist, 
has been uh, the way that um, Gestalt therapy, oh, well, do you want to talk about the misunderstanding? Because I think that's where we started with that. The Gestalt therapy being misunderstood. Well, there's not much to say. I, I just, my experience is, is that Gestalt therapy is probably the most misunderstood therapy system that there is. It, it, here we have a brilliant, brilliant way of looking at how people grow, you know, self-regulation, this, this disruption of self-regulation. It's a, it's, a, it's a theory of health and how we screw that up and how we can become aware of that and choice follows awareness. And it's, it's just, it's almost not even a theory. It's, it's an empirical observation of functioning. In fact, the way we don't pay attention to clinical diagnosis, we pay attention to functional diagnosis. And, but anyway, this is, comp this over, what has frustrated me is I've seen this misunderstood and as I've moved into the academic settings, I've seen it misunderstood. And, I, and I've made it over the years and years and years, my business to show them that I'm talking about the teachers there. I would be doing right. demonstrations in front of the whole school. I would show them how it's misunderstood. But it's still misunderstood. That's a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I and, then, and then I guess my piece of that is um, seeing new therapies come along or purportedly new therapies, therapies that are, <laughs> are, are acting like they're new. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having the Schalt therapy um, concepts, ideas, whatever, uh, without um, really acknowledging the, the ground of Gestalt therapy, the ground. And uh, it does not bring out the best in me when that happens. <laughs> Uh, you know, someone. Well, said, I mean, sometimes it is authentic ignorance, but sometimes <laughs> it's deliberate misrepresentation. Right. Uh -huh. Todd Burley, who was um, part of the LA Institute, did a presentation one year at a conference. I don't remember which Puebla, conference it Puebla. was. Oh, was it Puebla? Yeah. And um, he talked about uh, things being um, either borrowed from or stolen from Gestalt therapy. And I loved that because his distinction was um, uh, borrowing means you, you take it, but you give Gestalt therapy credit. And stealing means you take it, but you don't give Gestalt therapy credit. Now, sometimes, admittedly, people have come to the same understanding without it being grounded in, you know, or taken from or whatever, Gestalt therapy. Um, but um, anyway, that that is has been challenging for me when someone will present something or talk about something or i'll be in conversation and someone will say oh this thing about you know whatever and i'll be like wait a minute we were talking about that as gestalt therapists in the 70s um mm -hmm. and so i wish that i could be more equanimous about that um like Apparently, I don't think I was in this conversation, but that someone once asked Irv Polster, like, <laughs> do you think Gestalt therapy will be around in 50 years? And he said, sure, but it won't be called Gestalt therapy. So his understanding or his idea was that there'd be this melding of understandings and theories and that something new would get created. And he seemed fine with that. And I wish I could be more... Um, <laughs> <laughs> more of that of that sense of it but I always feel like when some of these things get pulled out that something's lost mm -hmm. and that I really don't want some of those pieces to be lost so then I become invested in but wait a minute you know here's the, the gestalt therapy piece of this um, and I guess another another piece along those lines in terms of what we've done is we have been integrative. We spent about five years studying self-psychology and inner subjectivity, and we wrote an article on um, integrating self-psychology developmental theory into Gestalt therapy practice. Steve did a lot of integrating of Dan Weil's work with Gestalt therapy, and then the Buddhist psychology. So we have a lot of what we've done is also looking for where those places are that some of the different ideas do come together and giving credit um, to, you know, to both. 
when you just when you talk about all of the things oh then we did five years of this and then i'm just imagining that the two of you would be like the coolest grandparents i mean you're <laughs> certainly not just sitting around it's just yeah, yeah. so and that that is that is another question which is i mean i i get the impression that you definitely do this together but not alone so what is your sense of being part of or being involved with the Gestalt community? Does that phrase mean anything to you? Gestalt community? Yes. Oh, what is yes. that oh, absolutely. You? Yeah. You know, we were, we were involved in the Gestalt community, um, you know, before uh, AAGT existed. For example, when there were Gestalt Journal, the conferences were put on by Joe Weissong and the Gestalt Journal conferences. So we were part of that whole uh, evolution that moved into having an organization, the AAGT. And I would say, like going to the conferences and connecting with people in those ways has really been such a big support and instrumental in honing our thinking and supporting. You know, every time we've, I was just saying to Steve, every time we presented at a conference, we just got so much support and so much, we'd always be worried, like someone's not gonna like this or agree with it, or are we gonna be challenged about this? And it wasn't that way. People were just, have been just interested, open, available. Not that the other elements of the community, that, that that's always the case in some of the other ways of interaction, but that's always been my experience like at the conferences. And then, you know, we've developed friends out of that. And actually when I think about our connections, John Fru, who is also a partner, has been a partner with us in our training program and team taught Gestalt therapy. Steve invited him in to team teach with him uh, a number of years in, and he's been an important person and support in that process as well. So yeah, never alone. It's never alone, I don't think. And we've Did also, you, well, I'm sorry, Heather, go right ahead. No, I was going to ask if you wanted to say anything to that. Uh, we've also put energy into um, developing as much as we can a, a Gestalt community in Portland. Mm -hmm. And in 2014, uh, we put tremendous energy into having a conference in Portland. Well, what did we call that conference again? Uh, state of the, the state art of, of Gestalt Therapy. The state of the art of, of Gestalt Therapy. And we had different people come in and present. And of course we presented too, but that we had a really good turnout. And um, this, Brad, Brad Larson, Sanchez and I were co-conveners of that, of that conference. And um, Brad has been you know, hugely involved now in the, in the whole Portland uh, mm -hmm. world of Gestalt therapy as well. And so out of that, we've had ongoing meetings, people interested in, in the Portland community to, to have meetings. We've had one, once a month meetings. A lot of them took place in our house because we didn't have a place to meet and uh, they're still going on. The, the meetings, we still have a Portland community that still goes on and we have people presenting and uh so yeah so things have developed like that okay. so on on the other side of the question about challenges um i wanted to ask you what some of your high points or what you would say one of your peak moments or one of your greatest memories would be and you i'm honestly equally curious about that as a person or as a person within gestalt Mm. whatever you feel like you might like to share. I have one story that's really personal, but it's Gestalt related. Um, so at one point in our training, we um, brought Irv Polster to do a workshop. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know how, just how the logistics worked out. I think I was just taking him to lunch and um, we there was a time issue and he wanted to get back in time to have some rest before the afternoon session and i don't think you were with us i don't maybe no, i don't remember no. but um i was so i'm i'm in the car i'm driving i have irv in the car and um we go to this restaurant and i'm trying to parallel park near the restaurant and um having trouble and i'm about to give up and think this space is just too small. I can't park the, the car in this space. And Irv just 
calmly says to me, I think you can do it. And so I gave it one more try and got the car into the space and we went in and had lunch. And, um, you know, I, uh, growing up, um, wasn't necessarily used to uh, encouragement or support like that, like, oh yeah, you know, you can do it. Um, and it was such a powerful, I mean, I remember it, however many years later this is, it was such a powerful moment. So it wasn't, um, uh, you know, specifically about Gestalt therapy, it was just about Irv being who he is, but it happened because of uh, our um, uh, being involved in Gestalt therapy, having a relationship with Irv and I think a lot of the highlights are like that. Um, I'm just, just that thinking that so many of the experiences that people mention, um, you know, it's I was picking somebody up from the airport or we were in a car or over lunch. And it, it's, it's those famous liminal spaces, right? Like in between, in the transitions. And it's, so, yeah, I mean, I love online work, but the liminal spaces, are not there yeah or they're different That's, yeah so you know those connections with people uh, at, mm -hmm. in a process group at a conference uh in a presentation um dancing at a conference you know being just being uh when we used to go to the pollsters it was like being at summer camp I mean, we were just kids and they were the adults and we were just having fun and we'd all go out together as a group and have dinner. There'd be lots of laughing and lots of uh, just, you know, intense connecting and uh, depth, you know, deep work, but mm -hmm. also levity. Um, it's, it's can't be, it's not even really describable and it can't be, I think, overestimated in some way. The, importance of those experiences well even when we were in when we were in mexico and getting to hang out with um perry and his wife and patricia tucker and you know those are connections that have developed um you know over these years through that through that community and every time i see those people it's a highlight mm -hmm. yeah, thank you and that we get to do it together is yeah, I found myself going, well, let me think of one, and I can't think of one, but there's so many that just like Eva just laid this all out. In terms of gestalt, we're talking about all these, all these weekends, week, weeks of, uh, of being down there in La Jolla and uh, just, you know, just amazing times with people. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing that jumps out as a story you'd like to share? A story I'd like to share. Um, I can't, I'm just blanking right now, but I can't think of any one story. We could talk about the, the photograph of you from one of your months with the pollsters, <laughs> <laughs> where, you're, where you're at a naked party and uh, <laughs> I, have a, I think you had a, like a camera around your neck or something. And then... I, I had a hat on, <laughs> a cowboy hat, okay. and I had the camera, which was, you know, it was a long time ago. We didn't have these little cell phones. I had a camera around my neck and that was it. And everybody's oh. naked, and I was naked, and I'm just standing there naked. And somebody <laughs> takes a shot at me, and I got this really stupid looking grin on my face. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been immortalized. <laughs> <laughs> but we call it a Bacchus party. That's what it was called. And, okay. and it was at Irvin Miriam's house, where everybody's running around naked, having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> it was the 70s. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was, it was different times. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay, and, and I guess I have not any naked gestalt stories yet. Actually, very few yeah, naked gestalt fun. moments have have come out. So thank you for for sharing that. We don't get to do that anymore, you know. But I'm also grateful that we came of age in that period of time. Not that there weren't downsides to it, but mm -hmm. we came of age in that period of time where there certainly was a, a blossoming into a lot of of freedom in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. 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 Tremendous, tremendous expansion. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the last question that I think I would put out to you um, is what's next for you guys personally, professionally, and what do you think might be next for Gestalt? I'll just take a shot at this. Uh, so uh, 
I hope there's for me a next, you know, in terms of my physical situation, that's it, there's so much uncertainty and I really want a next. And um, I think this, this is like a big thought, okay? And this is very much connected to Gestalt therapy, um, Buddhist psychology inf influenced, in, influenced in Gestalt therapy, then back to what we've written about. I, I'm gonna get a little bit political now, and I, but, it's, but it comes from what I really believe. I think that our pl planet and our, our world is in a very horrible position. Uh, yeah, we've got, we've, got a, um, we've got a climate crisis, obviously, that could be the end of certain species, could be the end of certain land masses, could destroy us in certain ways. I mean, it's just obvious. It's a horrible thing going on. And uh, uh, look, at, we've got this election coming up with Trump, who um, is uh, sociopathic and... Um, uh, he Remember, wants... you're not supposed to say anything bad about it. Oh, okay. Well... <laughs> no, that's okay. That, that's the exception to the rule. Trump is an exception. It's a phenomenological uh, observation. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. right. <laughs> he wants to be a dictator, and it's very dangerous right now. That's just, that's just a symptom of what we've gotten to with our inequality and all the stuff that everybody knows about. And I'll see if I can quickly get to my wish and, and point here with the combination of Buddhist psychology and Gestalt therapy. I think that we can contribute to something good happening here, having to do with the evolution of our consciousness. Hmm. The evolution of our consciousness. Now, this is not just Gestalt therapy alone. This is both of them. This is, this is what I feel is one of the contributions of the combination of the two. And um, my thinking about that is, is to, I just simplify it, basically two places, two places. One is the, is the obvious understanding that we all are interconnected. You know, that's just, we're, we're interdependent and interconnected. And we have to understand that. The, the, the rich guy behind the, glad, behind the gated community is going to be affected by the homeless people in the street. We are interconnected. And uh, through Buddhist psychology, and, and especially through Buddhist psychology, the understanding of how that happens and how it's inherently true, the causes and conditions are always causing every, nothing stands alone, nothing stands alone in isolation. I don't want to start lecturing. And the second piece, which, which is um, the value, the importance of, of um, the value of human connection. Now, I'm talking. I can, I can, I can refer to this from our Gestalt therapy um, way of looking at this as dialogue, in terms of in terms of seeing another person as valuable, as and from the Buddhist perspective, we all have Buddha nature in us, and 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 we cultivate metta and we cultivate compassion. And this is not only the way we see another person, which influences, us, influences how we have to, it's just inherently within our heart, hold the other person as a thou. It, it comes from this. And we can be taught this if, we're, if we're, we're, we're learning Gestalt therapy from the training program, but it, it's a very deeper level of understanding if, if it comes from a, a Buddhist education and experience. And I think that if the world can start to get this, we will start thinking of our fellow person as a thou, and that will contribute with, a lot, with the other one to our sense of, of, of maybe, the, maybe our species can survive. And this is the way that we can contribute to that. Hmm. So that's my, my little political, not maybe, I don't know, my political, sociological, um, challenge here for us it's huge and very very valid and a lot of people see that i mean when i say where can gestalt go it can go there yeah yeah what about you eva right um well you know we're learning very much to live with uncertainty and the unknown and so uh I've been, since we've been here for this last month, we did a couple days of a, a sort of retreat days where we were doing a lot of meditation and I was playing with the no future 
idea. Um, how much we reflexively go to the future and the next thing. And what if there is no future? What if there's no future as we've known it? Um, and how that brings me and potentially us into this more radically present experience um, and the importance of the moment that we're in. Um, and that seems, it's a little bit paradoxical, but in terms of where we go or what's next, it's like, can we, can we do that more? Can we be more attentive to the moment, to what's happening in a, in a more in a loving, more compassionate, more grounded way? And, you know, I know when I've been on meditation retreats, I might, you know, see a, I don't know, a slug in the path or something and pick it up and move it out of the way so no one steps on it which I might not do in my normal life, but there's something about when we're slowed down and we're um, tenderized and uh, you know, grounded in that way in the present, maybe we can uh, treat each other differently. It goes along with what Steve's saying, treat each other differently or have a different, a different way of, of being. Um, but I, right now, our future is very unknown. Um, and for Gestalt therapy, I think I think there's enough uh, enough good, enough good kernels, and enough things that uh, I hope um, that it continues. And it's going to be up to you, folks, the young, you know, the young people with the young energy. <laughs> I remember looking around at a conference not that long ago, a couple conferences ago, and thinking there are too many gray heads in this, <laughs> in this uh, audience here. We've got to bring in some young energy if this is going to yeah. have a continuation. So I'm glad, happy for you all that are doing that, that have that energy and that are bringing it. And I hope that that will continue. And I hope. I hope to be able to support that process um, for uh, as long as I can. And we're writing a, um, a chapter for a new book that's going to be coming out. Um, and what's the name of that chapter? Relational Embodied. Embodied Relation. Em embodied embodied relational, relationship. Uh, embodied <laughs> relational. It's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> embodied relational presence in Buddhist psychology informed gestalt therapy. So, oh, cool. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's oh. going to be a, a book of coll a collection of a bunch of different Peter. Um, Peter Cole. Peter Cole's oh, organized, okay. has been organizing that. Yeah. So, we're, we're working on that. So, there is at least that, that next. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Well, actually, the, the last thing that I would like to do before we uh, say goodbye would be to ask you if you have any questions for each other or a question for each other. Oh, my, 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 my. Boy, Heather, you really just, I'll tell you, your questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the coffee is the size of my head, so I can just do this, you know. <laughs> You got a question for me? Do you want to say anything about what you would like your legacy to be? Oh, wow. Well, well, <laughs> it's got to be, um, I mean, the, the, the thing that's aside from uh, how I work, uh, it would, you know, there's, I guess there's two parts to that. It's one, how I might work and the way I work and what I do when I work. And that's one part. But the other part is uh, who I've influenced. And I think that um, I will start with who I've influenced and just say my, my, I really determined to bring Gestalt therapy to academic settings very early on. And I did that. And I did that. And especially with, with uh, what turned out to be Pacific University teaching Gestalt therapy for God knows how long and creating classes and being on their ground floor and, and people following me into like getting really turning people on. And uh, of course I didn't end up the only one there. John Frew was there, Eva was there, but I think that, okay, I'll just stick with that. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, when you say that, I think that you influenced you know, hundreds of students over the years. 
and between your energy, your enthusiasm, your excitement, your personality, all of that uh, drew so many people into the world of Gestalt therapy and that spreads, you know, people like, you know, now those people are uh, training and supervising people and doing Gestalt therapy and creating Gestalt therapy community and uh, yeah. So that's a lot. Mm. Yeah. I, I got some Steve legacy from you in the lobby of the hotel in Mexico in about three seconds. But it was it was like a lightning strike. I don't know. You were on your way somewhere, but you just you saw me and you stopped and you grabbed me by the shoulders and you just looked me like you looked right through me. I don't know where you were looking, but you just said, have a good life. <laughs> just held my gaze and I was just like okay <laughs> and when you said now you know that the gymnast body and the karate body there was just so much strength and just the force that came out of you towards me and through me in that moment I was just like holy crap <laughs> was, that was that was a a very, very tiny microscopic kind of legacy moment. I can still feel <laughs> that. It was, that was interesting. I I've just wanted to it. let you know. I don't okay. even know if you remember that. But. I kind of do. I, I've, been, I've been known to be very intense. And I hope, Yeah, I there hope. was a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what, what about your question for Eva? Would you have a, do you have a question for Eva? Oh, man. Eva is the best consultant hyphen supervisor. I, I, I don't think I've mentioned that, you know, what we are to each other is that we all, all help each other with our work, aside mm -hmm. from many other things. And sh there is nobody better than her when you have a question about something that you're doing that you're, that's confusing you with a patient or whatever. She is incredible. Um, so I'm not sure why that just popped into my mind in terms of uh, what was the question about legacy? What no, your no. question is for her. That's a question for me. Do I simply have a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's more about a want. I want her to continue doing what she's doing. I, I think she's so goddamn good, so talented. Uh, there is no better at, 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 and people that get in therapy with her never. I kind of want to uh, you, ask you to look at her. When you never, say <laughs> never, never, never leave. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could be in therapy with her. <laughs> Although she does treat me, she, sometimes we'll have sessions, you know, <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> Thank you. So, hmm. I, want, I want her work to continue. Hmm. I feel somewhat sad when I say that. Hmm. Uh, my intention hmm. is to stick around. Please do. Yeah. Well, should we leave it there then? I am very, very, very grateful to the two of you for your time and your generosity before the interview with Mexico, with everything, but especially for this right now, this has been lovely. Yeah, this has been yeah. great, Heather. Thank you for doing it's what great. you're doing. And again, thank you for your persistence in um, encouraging us because I don't know if we would have done it otherwise. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for that. And um, just want, want to continue to be a support for you in this work or whatever other work you're doing. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And anything I can do for you too? Thank thanks. you very much. Thank you.